Very kind. Thank you. Thank you, man. Well, the, um, this passage starts right off by surprising us because we have this man who's been carried to this gate probably from the time he was very young, day after day after day after day after day, going to the same place, saying the same words, doing the same things. And immediately we come across the first big issue that you and I are going to face when we leave this building. And the issue is not, for many of you, you've had your heart changed. For many of you, you've had your commitments reordered. For many of you, God has refreshed you and shown up in a way you weren't expecting. But what will get us in the end is not pornography, it's not going to be alcohol, it's not going to be Satan running around tempting us. The thing that's going to level us and soften and remove the power of these four days is our expectations. And what worries me is that we're going to end up going back to the same place and be seduced, not by a woman or a man, not by money, not by pride. We're going to be seduced by the routine. Right now on your desk are sitting a whole list of phone calls you need to make. Right now when you get home, there will be piled stacks of mail. You've got meetings coming up. Well, you've got planning meetings, you've got leadership meetings, you've got a camp, you've got to meet with the music director to figure out how you're going to calm him down because you're doing a work project when he's doing his cantata. And you deliberately planned it that way so you would miss the cantata. <laughs> but he figured it out. The reality is that for many of us here, we, we have a good heart and we want to change and we want to go back and we want to really make a difference, but we're going to leave this place and within seconds, within days, within hours, we're going to be back to the same old routine we always had. My counselor, who I meet with all the time, has a great little saying. She says, when you do what you always do, you get what you always get. So you may leave here with all of these dreams and hopes and expectations and all these words and notes and seminar stuff and all this stuff sort of running through your head and you're so anxious to get started, but you'll get right back into the same old routine again trying to cram all that stuff into the same stuff you've always done. And before you know it, your expectations will be diminished. They will be squashed and squandered and smothered. If you leave here with the same expectations, if you leave here deciding you will do what you always have done in the same language you've always used, in the same places you've always been, it's no wonder that before you know it, you'll be in the exact same place you were before you came here. This man had been begging so long that all he could ask for was money. The only thing that occurred to him that he needed was money. It didn't occur to him that he might be healed. It didn't occur to him that someone might walk along and give him his dancing back. He'd given up on dancing. He'd given up on walking. He'd given up on all that stuff. It was just no longer in his vocabulary. It was no longer in his list of expectations. Now all he wanted was money. I wonder how many of you are going to walk out of this place and you're going to go back home, and the only expectations you're going to have are more numbers, more people, more activities, more resources, more books, more, more things to do, more programs, more worship, more this, more that. I'm hoping and praying that you will leave here having been renovated and having your expectations completely redone so that when you leave here, you can no longer do the same things because you're not expecting the same results. You leave here and your results will be altered. They'll be changed. You see, I think routine deadens our imaginations. It deadens our expectations, our possibilities, our initiative, our energy. One day melts into the next. Every day is like the other day and slowly the life is sucked out of us and no longer do we live life but it lives us. Routine affects everything in our life. It affects our relationships, our conversation with others, our routine. Our, it dulls us and it robs us of time. And when we get into the routine, we stop noticing, we stop listening, we stop thinking. So here's this man whose expectations have been 
reduced to just money. You and I all know people like this who don't expect anything more from God. They don't expect anything to happen. They don't expect God to do anything. You don't just have to be charismatic to expect God to show up. That's for all of us. The entire church should be fragrant with the fragrance of expectancy. We're, we just don't know what God's going to do. We're so excited, anticipating, waiting, and, and, and what routine does is that it, it, it transforms us into one-dimensional people who lose touch, touch with the power of our choices, the options that we have, the differences that we can make. Life is put on hold, delayed, and we put it into storage and we leave it there. Oh, it's subtle. It's sneaky. And all of a sudden, before you know it, we just leave this place expecting the same old thing. Man, wouldn't it be awesome if we walked out of this room today saying, Lord, I have no idea what to expect, but I'm going to enlarge my expectations. I'm going to expect things nobody ever thought of. In fact, I'm just going to go out of here going, man, I am so expectant. And people are going to say, of what? And you're going to say, I don't know. But that's the problem because if I only expect what I know, then I'll never get to be able to experience what I didn't know. And if you and I will say, man, I, I, I've been changed. Well, how? I'm not sure. Well, what's going on? I'm not sure. But I'll tell you this, I'm not going to settle for what I've always settled for. I'm just not going to do it. Some of you are going, I work for a workaholic and I'm so busy and he's driving me crazy and I just don't know what I can do and I don't know how to handle it. Why don't you go back expecting that you're going to go to him and say, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to slow down. And if you fire me, good. Then I'll at least be fired when I'm slow. But I'm not going to keep doing this. My expectations have changed. I don't need to please you. I don't need to try. You're not my dad. I don't need to worry about this. I don't need to work out my issues like that. I'm going to listen to God and I'm going to... I'm going to do what he's asked me to do, and what he's asked me to do is to slow down. I don't even recognize my children, and I'm going to expect that by the end of this year, my kids and I are going to recognize each other. Oh, and then there's my wife, who I haven't noticed in six months. I haven't seen that the twinkle in her eyes beginning to dry up. I haven't noticed that she's becoming more and more sad. I didn't realize how depressed this whole thing was really making her. I didn't realize how many clues she's given me that she's dying and withering up inside and that her love for me is going. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to, I'm going to rekindle that passion. I'm going to do what she never expected. I'm going to come back from this conference, not with a bunch of idea books, but with those, but with a dozen roses, and I'm going to walk in the room and say, Woohoo! I just called a babysitter on my way in on the cell phone, and you and I are alone all day. And I even bought a bottle of wine, and I know we don't drink it, but Yacanelli said we could. <laughs> and we're going to spend the day loving each other and getting back to rediscovering who we are. Our expectations just get back to we're going to do the same old thing. I hope and pray that we have been renovated by this God. And it's just so amazing how our culture, how Satan works in our culture, it's not just abortion and pornography, he smothers our expectations. Robert Fulgham, who's written some great theological books, sort of, all I really need to know I learned in kindergarten, uh-oh, it was on fire when I laid down on it. He says, ask a kindergarten class. How many of you can draw? All the hands shoot up. Yes, of course we can draw. All of us. Well, what can you draw? Anything. Oh, yeah? Well, how about a dog eating a truck in a jungle? Sure. How big do you want it? How many of you can sing? All the hands go up. Of course we sing. What can you sing? Anything. Well, psh, what if you don't know the words? No problem. We'll make them up. Let's sing now. Why not? How many of you dance? Unanimous again. What kind of music do you like to dance to? Any kind. Let's dance now. Sure, why not? Do you like it to act in plays? Yes. Do you play musical instruments? Yes. Do you write poetry? Yes. Can you read and write and count? Yes. We're learning all that stuff right now. The answer is yes over and over again. The kids are confident in spirit, infinite in resources, eager to learn. Everything is still possible. That's how you and I should leave this building today. Let me repeat that. 
We're confident in spirit. We're infinite in resources. We're eager to learn. Everything is still possible. Try those same questions on a college audience. Small percentage of the students will raise their hands at all, and if asked to sing or dance or paint or play an instrument, they'll not infrequently, they'll raise their hands and then they'll qualify it. Well, I, I only play the piano, uh, I only draw horses, uh, I only dance rock and roll, I only sing in the shower. When asked why the limitations, college students answer that they don't have any talent or they're not majoring in the subject or they've not done any of these things since the third grade or worse, that they're embarrassed for others to see them to sing and dance and act. You can imagine the response to the same questions asked by an older audience. The answer is no, none of the above. And Fulgham asked this question, what happened? What went wrong between kindergarten and college? What happened to yes? Of course I can. And I'm here to say, if we leave this conference with all the books and tapes and everything else with a gazillion ideas, but our expectations haven't been changed, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and do a work in us so that when we walk out of this place, our expectations are wild. They're exploding. They're way beyond anything we ever imagined. The second thing that we notice here was not only the seduction of routine, but the death of surprise. Peter and John are walking along, and they heal the guy, and he starts jumping up and down, and it says that the crowd was filled with wonder and amazement. They were shocked. They were surprised. They were blown away. They were astonished. They were just sitting there going, whoa! See what Louis Giglio does to us? He just screws up our vocabulary. We hear him speak, and we leave here, and we go right back to our church, and we go, B. Uh, B. B. Between. There's B, and it's next to tween. I don't think this is working quite right. Our, you know, we just don't do it quite like he did it. It gets messed up. But I'm telling you, these crowd where they were so amazed and they were so blown away and they came to Peter and John and they, they put all their amazement on them and went, you guys are amazing. You're unbelievable. You're incredible. Wow, you guys are really something. And you remember what they said? Excuse me. It has nothing to do with us. This is all about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that you folks right here believe in, the God that you've believed in for centuries, for millenniums, the God that you speak about every day, the God that you fiercely defend and believe in, that God, that everyday God has been nearby ready to do the exact same things we did, and you missed it. The worst thing that could happen is for all of us to show up here next year and to walk into the room and look at each other and go, we missed it. We missed what God was doing. We were so busy doing God's work, we missed God. And my hope and prayer is that you and I will come back here celebrating how we didn't miss it. And that means that we have to work to make that happen. You have to have a church that's open to surprise, that still believes in miracles, that still believes in awesome things can happen right there in the church, in the congregation, in our meetings, in our board meetings, wherever we are. God is at work. He's stirring around, making things happen. In my church, one Sunday morning I was up preaching, and luckily we have Sadie in our church who's a Down syndrome girl. She sits in the front row. She's interrupted me numerous times. This Sunday morning, I'm preaching away, and I flipped back over to, I was going to read a scripture in Isaiah, and I flipped back over, and somehow I screwed it up, and I missed the, the page, and I couldn't remember where it was, and so there was this awkward pause while I'm stumbling around going, I know it's right here, I, I'm, I'm going to find it, I, just, just give me a minute here, I'll, I'll find it, and Sadie stands up and goes, oh, for heaven's sakes, let me do it. <laughs> well, that's great, but she doesn't even know what I'm looking for. She just walks up in front of, pushes me out of the way, takes the Bible, starts thumbing through it like this, and goes, and I look down, it's the passage. I am like totally freaked. I read the passage. Her dad came up to me later and he said, you faked that, right? You were kidding, right? I said, I am 
as God is my witness, I am not kidding you. Sadie knew where the Scripture was, and she was getting frustrated because I couldn't find it. So she just took care of it. Well, what's that about? I don't know. But I let Sadie do whatever she wants anymore. <laughs> Apparently, Sadie is in touch with something I didn't know about. She was not surprised that God would help her find the right Scripture. She had fully expectations that she would find the Scripture, that God would help her to do it, and she did it. And the rest of us in the room were just kind of going, whoa, we were amazed. That's what happens to us is that our, our, our surprises suddenly begin to dwindle because the culture out there begins to rob us of the opportunity to have so th those surprises because they're afraid somebody might get upset. Hello? That's what upset means, surprised, astonished, odd. Everybody that was crowded around this guy that was dancing, they were all going, Gah! whoa, whoa, they're dancing, they're jumping. What do you call that? That is surprise, and that's what happens when the living God shows up. I wish and hope that when we leave this place, churches all over this country are going to be having lots of surprises. Their church is going to be full of surprises. You're going to be full of surprises because you're now unemployed. All these things are going to happen. <laughs> Listen, I think we heard it from Lucas. Aslan is on the move. Spring is coming. Winter is beginning to thaw. God is at work all over the world. You can feel it. You can sense it. And it's happening a lot more in other countries, to be honest with you, than it's happening here. And that's because we have decided what our expectations are, and we've come up with them, and we've limited to them, and we put them in books, and we put them in CDs, and we got them all figured out. And I'm here to tell you, God says, you don't, you don't have a clue what I can do, and it's not going to fit in any book. Can you sense that these are not ordinary days? God is at work. The one final thing. The result of renovation. Now, I didn't have Mark read the whole passage because it's a very long passage because Peter starts preaching one heck of a sermon. And uh, he just really lets these people have it. He tells them that they don't understand God, they don't realize God, but here's what he says. This is really cool. In verse 19, he says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Wow! Isn't it interesting that when you hear the word repent, the first thing we do is just shut it off? Because we've heard the word so much. It's one of those church words that we just, you know, just, you grow up with, and it just becomes a deal. So, when, so like when I hear somebody say repent, I don't even listen. If I am listening, I just go, well, I hope the people in the audience that need to repent will hear that word. I've already decided I don't need repentance because I know what it is. I know what it means. I know what it's all about. I don't need to repent. And when I read this in here, I'm thinking Peter's telling everybody to repent. Boy, those people really needed to repent. It doesn't, but we need to understand what repent means. Repent doesn't just mean to repent because of my sin. It means to take responsibility for my own deadness, for missing God for walking right by Him, for tiny expectations, for settling less for, for less than we know we are. Repentance is the process we have to go through so we can now come alive and be filled with aliveness. And look what's happened. He says, if you repent, you're going to be refreshed. If you repent, then the time of refreshment is going to come. What a great word. It means to invigorate, to restore, to strengthen, renew, energize, awaken. It's more than healing. It's coming back to life. It's restoring what we lost. It is meeting Jesus face to face. It is coming back to our senses. It is becoming childlike once again. It is restoring our naivety and our innocence. It is all those things. When Peter says to repent, it's all full of all of those words. And my prayer for all of us is that we do not, that we think about what this means and realize that when you and I are restored and renovated, that life will happen in ways you never imagined. I just spoke at a friend of mine's church. He's in a big Presbyterian church in California, and it's one of those 
traditional Presbyterian churches. It was built in 1922. He wears robes. It's you know, the big the pulpit's way up high. I didn't stand in the pulpit because it's too high and it swallows me up. I'm not a real minister, so I didn't wear a robe. And I just stood down on the floor, and, 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 and the people have been coming there for literally, you know, decades. And they come in, and they sit down, and, and so I preached my sermon, and I got done, and I, I said a little prayer. It's like you, you're supposed to do. And I turned around to walk off, when all of a sudden I heard one person kind of applauding, and the next thing I know, Two people are applauding. The next thing I know, the whole congregation is applauding. And it wasn't like, you know, giant applause. It was just like, kind of like medium applause, Presbyterian applause. (laughs) And when I sat down, the minister said to me, that's never happened before. Now, before you think I'm talking to you about my incredible sermon there, that's not what this is about. The same thing that Peter said. That had nothing to do with it. I'll tell you what it had to do with it. When you speak the truth... When you present the gospel and people were not expecting it, when they had no idea what good news this really is, then even Presbyterians who never clap start clapping. They don't even know why. They walked out of that building and they're going, can can we do this? Are we in trouble with the Presbytery? Why were you clapping? I don't know. But something inside of me made me start clapping because the truth that they heard was so alive. They weren't expecting it. They were expecting the same old thing. And the same old thing didn't show up. And without them even trying or wanting to do it or anything else, that's why it wasn't giant applause because they're not supposed to. They were fighting it the whole time. Quit doing this. Don't be loud. You're going to make a scene. Presbyterians do not clap. This is not a charismatic church then stop your hands. I can't. Don't you think that that ought to be happening church after church after church, place after place after place? Wherever we go, we find ourselves applauding uncontrollably because God showed up and we're so blown away. We, we, don't, we, we think it's kind of silly to give God an applause, but we don't know what else to do. And our hands start moving and that's what we end up doing. This is what ought to be the characteristic of churches that wherever we go, People are applauding. They applaud during the offering. They applaud during the greeting. They applaud because suddenly God shows up and they're awestruck and they're blown away. Folks, please don't leave here with a commitment to do more. Leave here with a commitment to dance more. Don't leave here with a commitment to run faster. Leave here with a commitment to run straight to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you where people want you to run. Run to the numbers. Run to the activities. Run to the program. Run to the staff meetings. Run to all that stuff. And I hope you leave this place going, that's not what I'm going to do. There's a great guy on PBS. His name is Bill Harley. And Bill is one of the most amazing storytellers you've ever come across. He loves to tell the story about T-ball. Now, you know what T-ball is. T-ball is that little game you play with the the, the pre-Little League kids to kind of teach them baseball, sort of. Every kid can play. So there's like 25 kids on a team. And they go all over the field. And and then you have a little tee up there with the ball on it. And the kid comes up and he hits it. And uh, then what happens is the kids all kind of panic and run and grab it. A lot of times the kids will hog the ball and won't give it to anybody and chase after the person to touch them. Other times, they start passing it to every kid in the place, and, uh, and everybody gets up, and everybody gets to hit, doesn't matter how many outs there are, and everybody cl- applauds everybody. So he said I brought, he brought his son to uh, one of these t-ball games, and they played a team that they played many times before. And on that team, there was a little girl I will call Tracy. Tracy came each week. I know, since my son's team played her team all the time. She wasn't very good. She had Coke bottle glasses and hearing aids on each ear. She ran in a loping, carefree way with one leg pulling after the other, one wild arm windmilling wildly in the air. Everyone in the bleachers cheered for her, regardless of for what team their progeny played. In all the games I saw, Tracy never hit the ball, not even close. 
It sat there on the tee waiting to be hit, but it never was. Sometimes after 10 or 11 swings, Tracy hit the tee. The ball, of course, would fall off the tee, sit on the ground six inches in front of home plate. Run, run, yelled Tracy's coach. And Tracy would lope off to first, clutching the bat in both arms, smiling. Someone usually woke up and ran her down with the ball before she reached first, but it didn't matter. Everybody applauded anyway. The last game of the season, Tracy came up, and by some fluke or simply a nod towards the law of averages, she creamed the ball. She smoked it right up the middle through the legs of 17 players. <laughs> Kids dodged as it went by or looked absentmindedly as it rolled unstopped, seemingly gaining in speed, hopping over second base, heading into center field. And once it reached there, there was no one to stop it. See, have I told you there's no outfielders in T-ball? Well, I mean, there are for three minutes in the beginning of each inning, but then they move to the inland to be closer to the action, or at least to their friends. Tracy hit the ball and stood at home delighted. Run, yelled her coach. Run. All the parents, all of us, we stood up and screamed, run, Tracy, run, run. Tracy turned and smiled at us and then, happy to please, galumped off to first base. When she got to first base, the first base coach waved his arms round and round when Tracy stopped at first. Keep going, Tracy, keep going, go. Happy to please, she headed to second. By the time she was halfway to second, seven members of the opposition had reached the ball and were passing it amongst themselves. <laughs> it's a rule in T-ball. Everybody on the defending team has to touch every ball. The ball began to make its long and circuitous route towards home plate, passing from one side of the field to the other. Tracy headed to third. Adults fell out of the bleachers. Go, Tracy, go. Tracy reached third and stopped. But her parents were very close to her now, and she got the message. Her coach stood at home plate, calling her as the ball passed over the first baseman's head and landed in the fielding team's empty dugout. <laughs> Come on, Tracy. Come on, baby. Get a home run. Tracy started for home. And then it happened. During the pandemonium, no one had noticed the 12-year-old geriatric mutt that had lazily settled itself down in front of the bleachers, five feet from the third baseline. As Tracy rounded third, the dog, awakened by the screaming, sat up and wagged its tail at Tracy as she headed down the line. The tongue hung out, mouth pulled back in an unmistakable canine smile, and Tracy stopped right there. Halfway home, 30 feet from a legitimate home run. She looked at the dog, her coach yelled, come on, Tracy, come on home. He went to his knees behind the plate, pleading. The crowd cheered, go, Tracy, go, come on, go. She looked at all the adults, at her own parents, shrieking and catching it all on video. She looked at the dog. The dog wagged its tail. She looked at her coach. She looked at home. She looked at the dog. Everything went into slow motion. She went for the dog. It was a moment of complete, stunned silence. And then perhaps not as loud, but deeper, longer, more heartfelt. We all applauded as Tracy fell to her knees to hug the dog. Two roads diverged on a third baseline. Tracy went for the dog. I hope you do too. And when you leave this place, all the people in the stands are going to be screaming, get the more kids, do more activities, get going, get more busy. You can do it. You can go for it. You'll hit a home run. We'll be supporting you. We'll give you even more money. But just to your right, as you pass third base, you'll see him. It'll be Jesus, smiling, his tongue hanging a little bit out, <laughs> looking straight at you. And I hope with all my heart that you will look around and then go for Jesus. Go for it. God bless you.